The Roaring Twenties, an era of excitement like few others in American history. An era of uproar in, well, everything. A scandalous dance called the Charleston caught on, bringing hemlines up so they could swing to the new music. Ladies bobbed their hair and covered it with cloche hats. The noble experiment tried vainly to erase demon drink from America. Speakeasies, though, became as common as prohibition agents, and bootleggers were both the heroes and the villains of the age. Scarface Al Capone was a legendary example. Harding headlined the executive branch and Teapot Dome, but America kept cool with Coolidge. <laughs> A young pilot named Charles Lindbergh flew non-stop across the Atlantic and shrank the world, earning its lasting adulation. The incomparable Babe Ruth, too, was known and loved throughout the world. But perhaps the grandest star of the era was the automobile. Nothing in the 20s revolutionized the lifestyle of Americans more than the incredible motor car. Henry Ford's development of the assembly line boosted both employment and wages and set off the modern American Industrial Revolution. Everywhere, more and more people went to work in factories, turning out products by the hundreds of millions. But somewhere along the assembly line, the workers often got lost in the rush of production. Considered an extension of the machinery, the industrial man was often less important than his output. Working conditions were difficult, supervision usually autocratic, and benefits non-existent for most workers. In sweatshops and even in better factories, it was production that mattered. At Western Electric's Hawthorne Works in Chicago in the 1920s, telephone equipment was being manufactured by 40,000 people. What Hawthorne employees had received their company paid pension plan back in 1906. They had vacations one week after five years, and they had sickness disability pay. Hawthorne was considered a progressive place to work. Those who worked at Hawthorne uh really respected in the uh, in the neighborhood it was uh, considered quite a privilege to be working here at this and three other companies in 1924 the national academy of science began an experiment to determine how illumination affects worker efficiency the premise was that output would improve if the lighting of work areas was improved Something very curious happened when new experimental lights were installed. Output went up among those employees being studied, and also among those whose lighting had not been changed. And most puzzling of all, it continued to go up even when lights were turned down. Having proved nothing, these studies were called off by the National Academy. It might all have ended there. Relay making was picked for a new experiment when Western Electric alone decided to probe the inconclusive results of the illumination studies. Six young women assembled the electromagnetic switches while rest breaks and different hours were tried. It was the core of what would later be called the Hawthorne Studies, industry's first scientific inquiry into employee attitudes. Continuing changes in routine were freely discussed with the workers, whose output as well as involvement in the project increased dramatically. Each completed relay was counted by a tireless tape, which recorded an overall production increase of 30%. In this small room for more than five years, observers studied workers producing more in less time than ever before. Industrial history was in the making. The Hawthorne-Harvard Cooperative Inquiry continued into the 30s, delving into production areas all over the plant. When the early returns from the relay room began to be understood, the investigators felt the attitudes of other workers ought to be explored. They began industry's first formal employee interviewing program. Some 20,000 Hawthorne people aired their feelings about their jobs, their supervisors, working conditions about anything and everything. 
In other experiments, investigators found the first clues to the social organization of people at work, an organization that seemed to have as much or even more impact on output than anything management did. Though not all the results were as dramatic as the relay room, in general, output increased wherever these tests were tried. The investigators found industry had never tapped the workers' real worth and sent the massive proof back to Harvard for compilation. The point of view which gradually emerged from the studies was to regard a business organization as a social system. Everyone knows that people are important in business, but a way of thinking which allowed the satisfactions and dissatisfactions of workers to be thought about in relationship to output and productivity and to allow new studies and new actions to be taken had not been available before. This is the real contribution of the Hawthorne studies.